Right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we've got a, an attendance on my list which says 78 people, so this is the largest we've had so far. So I'd like to welcome you to the York Society of Engineers and University of York uh, joint lectures. We have six um, joint lectures starting in October, uh, approximately the first or second Thursday in the month. And um, this is the third lecture. And I'll just like to make an announcement that we also have a lecture on the Thursday, the 14th of January, uh, same time, uh, and it'll be the same link, and it'll also be on the university webpage. Uh, so it's, it's Supercomputers for Science by Professor Matt Probert, who's um, a colleague in the physics department at the University of York. So as I said, we have um, uh, six lectures. This is the third lecture. And uh, um, we've got the next lecture arranged, and we're hoping to have a, another two after that. So I'd like to introduce our guest, uh, John Guest, who's going to give a talk on lessons from an aircraft crash. And John worked as a pilot and a training captain for British Airways for 33 years. And to, towards the end of his career, he was involved in a major training course for cabin crew which included a detailed look at the British Midland 737 crash in 1989 at Kegworth. And we're very pleased to welcome John to give us a talk about this. So over to you then, John. Uh, thank you very much. And um, can I just check that everyone can hear? Can you give a thumbs up to Jeremy? I can't see you. Right, yes, I, I can hear. I can hear you, John. Great. So I was very fortunate in um, being had my training paid for me in the boom years when they needed lots of new pilots. And my first aeroplane was the um, BOAC VC-10, which is on the top left of the screen. Uh, and, and then uh, for 10 years, I flew the early version of the 747 uh, before moving to 737s flying around Europe um, for my command. Um, the one that's showing on the screen is the, the 200 series, which has the sort of stovepipe engines and the electromechanical instruments. And then for the last, um, and then of course I did fly the 737-400, which we're going to talk about tonight. And then for the last six years of my career, I flew both 757s and 767s, which although they are quite different aeroplanes, are made to be fly, flown by the same people. Um, and Jeremy's already said what I did during my last four years. The course was called, um, British Airways called it Crew Resource Management, and it was a course that was required by the Civil Avi Aviation Authority as a result of the crash I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I thought you'd like to see a, a pretty picture of an aeroplane. Um, that's uh, the 100 series 747 um, that I flew from 1975 to about 85. Um, and here's me uh, arriving for work in the uh, crew reporting center uh, just at the north of Heathrow, where both the flight crew and the cabin crew all report together. I just thought to add um, authority to what I'm saying, you'd like to see me in my uniform, in my prime while I still had hair. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight um, is the, uh, I'm going to tell quite briefly the story of the crash and how it happened, but then look in some detail at the error chain, all the different things that went wrong to, um, cr to turn what should have been a perfectly manageable um, technical difficulty into a crash. And then quite um, much more briefly, I'm going to look at the aftermath, which I think is salutary, and then a little bit at the wider lessons, some of which will be very familiar to a lot of you, I'm sure. Uh, this was the um, air accident investigation uh, report um, on the crash, and I've drawn very heavily on this. There's not much in what I'm going to say, which is my own opinion. Most of it comes directly from this um, excellent report that was produced 15 months after the accident. 
This is the aeroplane, 737 400. Um, the 3, 4, and 500s were a family. Um, this was the biggest of them. Um, of course, they've been replaced now by the um, 6, 7, and 800, uh, which have winglets. Uh, those are the ones you see mostly at airports nowadays. At 8 o'clock in the evening, roughly, um, they took off on a routine flight to Belfast, 118 passengers. That's not quite a full aeroplane two flight crew and six cabin crew, which is a bit more than's needed. Um, I'm not sure why they had extra people on board. There's nothing significant about that. It often happens. Um, pilots talk about there being a handling pilot and a non-handling pilot. Um, the one who's actually holding the control column or using the autopilot to fly the aeroplane is the handling pilot. And on this occasion, it was the co-pilot who did the takeoff, the climb out of London, the cleanup. I expect that roughly when they level off at 6,000 feet to go out below the London stacks, um, he would stick the autopilot in and use that then to climb on their way. As they went through 28,000 feet, the uh, left-hand engine um, had a severe failure. This is the story I'm going to tell tonight. Um, uh, 39 people died instantly, eight very quickly afterwards, and almost all the rest of the people on board were seriously injured. It was a, a catastrophic crash. To understand what first went wrong, you have to know a little bit about uh, modern jet engines. This is called a turbofan, and it's the sort of engine that powers um, every aeroplane flying today. The, most of the air that goes in the front of the engine um, goes through the big fan at the front and gets blown out the back much faster, and that's what causes the aeroplane to go. Um, it's, a, it's a ducted propeller in, in effect. Um, inside all of that, there's the hot bit of the engine, and there are two shafts, a low-speed shaft and a high-speed shaft. The low-speed shaft carries the fan, and the first nine, I think it's nine stages of the compressor, the high speed shaft, then another eight stages of compressor. Um, and um, by the time the air that's going through the middle of the engine has gone through those 15 stages of compressors, I know that didn't add up, 15 stages of compressors, it's um, very compressed and very hot. It's about 400 degrees Celsius. And then it goes into the flame tubes where the kerosene's injected and the whole thing um, burns, producing a huge expansion, which rushes out through the turbines at the back of the um, of the engine. Uh, some of the turbines f power the high-speed shaft, but most of them uh, provide the, the power for the big fan at the front of the um, engine, which is what this is all about. That's what makes the aeroplane go. Through 28,000 feet, um, the, one of the fan blades on the left-hand engine delaminated um, and the bits spat out the back of the fan. But of course, it hugely imbalanced the, the fan structure. And that meant that there was um, massive vibration and smoke and fumes, some of which went into the cockpit itself. Captain then um, takes control of the, he takes over as handling pilot, takes control of the aeroplane, takes out the autopilot, takes out the auto throttle, and asks the first officer to identify the engine problem. And the first officer says, it's the left, left, no, the right engine. As the auto throttle is disconnected, the um, vibration diminishes rapidly and the smoke and fumes seem to get less. So they begin to think they've done the right thing. And the captain then calls for the right hand engine to be throttled to be retarded, which he does. And the, the vibration stops and the smoke and fumes stop and they think they've done the correct thing. And because they are happy that they've identified it correctly, the captain then orders the shutdown of the right-hand engine. I don't take this map too literally. By now, they're roughly a beam Lester, um, and um, they are going to go divert to the nearest suitable airfield, which is what you do on a twin-engine airplane if one of the engines failed. Um, 
an engine can fail at any point in flight and nobody should suffer any significant damage at all. You can either stop on the runway if it's slow or if you've got to the point of takeoff, you can continue on the remaining engine. But with only one engine left, it's of course prudent and required to land at the nearest suitable airfield. And the nearest one was um, what's called East Midlands Airport. Castle Donington is what I know it as. Um, by the village of Kegworth on the M1 is where Donington services are and it's not very far from where they were and whilst it was nice that they were quite close to somewhere it also meant that the time between the engine failure and them actually uh, approaching Castle Donington airfield to land um, is extremely busy they are liaising with air traffic control and they had to change frequencies and re-identify themselves several times. They had to alert British Midland to the fact that they were about to get 120 passengers at um, East Midlands that they weren't expecting at the broken aeroplane. Uh, they had to brief the passengers, they had to brief the cabin crew and they had to manage the descent. Um, Contrary to uh, what you will see sometimes in the papers, uh, jet aeroplanes do not plummet like stones. There's a huge amount of potential energy up there. Uh, they come down with idle power at about four degrees. So the height has to be got rid of in an orderly fashion. And uh, throughout that, they are being uh, given radar assistance to line up with the westerly facing runway at East Midlands. And they're also trying to um, adjust the height of the aeroplane so that when they join the um, instrument landing system for East Midlands they're at roughly the right height. Four minutes before uh, landing they are at that they are in that condition and the captain puts some power on the left-hand engine and for about a minute and a half it works fine um, and then it um, fails completely and catches fire. They then realize that they shut down the wrong engine and they attempt to restart the right hand engine. There are ways of restarting engines in flight, but from where they were then, they have nothing like enough time um, to restart the engine. So the captain, while the co-pilot tries to restart the engine, the captain is trying to um, use what height he has left to, to stretch the glide um, to the, the, he can actually reach um, the, the runway. Um, this is what he would have been looking at. Um, he can't get there. Um, they hit the ground first on the near side of the M1, which wipes the undercarriage off the aeroplane. They cross the M1 miraculously, not hitting any traffic or even the lamp standards. But by then the aeroplane is dipping nose down and goes nose first into the far bank and breaks into three main pieces, uh, which is what makes it such a serious accident. Um, they're about less than half a mile from the runway at that point. I think that's the end of the the story of the um, of what of the flight and what happened. And what I'm now going to do is is go through what I see as the error chain that caused the accident to be so catastrophic. But I can't see your faces, and I've been talking for a long time. Jeremy, is there anything anyone who needs to ask something urgently now? Uh, I don't know. Um... If, if anybody would like to ask a, a question, I don't know whether you want the questions at the end, John, or might you take some questions now? Uh, basically at the end, but I'm aware that I can't see anybody, so I don't know what the reaction no, is. No, we, still, we still have 80 people here. Um, All right. at, at the end, I'll just mention that at the end, the way we do questions is we ask people to raise their hand. Um, okay. Don't do it now. Raise it, raise it uh, at the end. So if you'd like to carry on, that's, that's, that's fine. Okay, so what went wrong? The first thing that went wrong is that engines shouldn't fail and um, fan blades shouldn't delaminate. And um, in investigating why this engine had failed, the accident investigation branch unearthed some very interesting stuff about the way the um, engine had been certified. 
there had been a previous version of the CFM 56, um, which um, had been in service for many years. And because the 737-400 was bigger and heavier, um, the engine had been uprated to produce more power. And this was called the C3 version. Now, whenever a new aeroplane or um, a new engine is brought into service that's based on an existing one, um, it may be slightly cynical of me to think, but that I think it's also partly true that the manufacturers will try and persuade the uh, aviation authorities that it's really very similar to the previous one and doesn't need the same sort of testing that you would do with a brand new engine. And indeed, they succeeded in um, convincing the Civil Aviation Authority. So the testing of the C3 version was done on ground rigs um, where you can run up to full power. And they did all sorts of things to the engine, but all at ground level. After the accident and during the investigation, they fitted one of these engines to their Boeing 707 test bed in place of one of its normal engines. They climbed the aeroplane with a cl what's called climb power set on the engine. It's about 90% of full power, and which is what they were using on the day. And they discovered that between 25,000 and 30,000 feet, there was a harmonic vibration set up in the fan structure, which over the previous months had caused a fatigue failure of the fan blade. So one of the things that went wrong was this, was that the testing and certification of this engine, of this mark of the CFM 56 was flawed. From the point where the um, engine itself failed, there were a series of problems, and this is the error chain I'm going to continue with. But the first thing that went wrong was that the certification was flawed and thus the engine itself failed. There's a sort of mythology that pilots are very cool in emergencies, isn't there? I'm sure you've heard this sort of thing, well, we're just going to do this and they're going to do that and everything will be okay. Well, it's partly true and pilots are quite good when things go wrong, but usually they know what's happened and they know what they're going to do next. And on this occasion, the pilots didn't understand what was happening and they were dealing with a failure that they had not trained for. And lots of very strong vibration and smoke and fumes in the flight deck is quite scary. There was at this point no checklist for dealing with a high vibration on one of the engines. Um, there are about a hundred emergency checklists kept in a quick um, help QRH um, quick reference handbook on the flight deck by the pilot's knees and some of them are memory items um, but most of them are well known and very logically set out but there wasn't one for a high vibration state so they treated it as an engine failure which they practiced dozens of times on flight simulators and of course, most training these days is done on flight simulators and no one had ever thought to simulate an experience, simulate this sort of um, failure with the very strong vibrations, which would be difficult to simulate and the smoke and fumes on the flight deck, which would be impossible to simulate at any ordinary costs. And then partly because they were puzzled, partly because they were scared, I speculate, they reacted rather too quickly to the failure. They tried to deal with it quickly. And everyone since Kegworth is aware that that is a fundamental mistake to make. You do it slowly. And of course, they did actually misidentify the problem engine. And one of the things we learn from this is that if there's the slightest doubt about which engine it is, don't do anything and wait until you've got some more evidence. Um, I wanted to show you a lovely picture of one of these 10 million pound devices dancing around on its six legs. They are the most extraordinary thing to watch from the outside. Um, if you do a rejected takeoff and put the brakes on heavily, the, the thing nearly stands on its nose. The back legs go right up in the air and it gives very powerful simulation of acceleration, deceleration and of yaw 
it gives a reasonable simulation of roll in the first instance, um, but it doesn't simulate um, any sort of pressurization problems. Your ears don't pop in there. It doesn't do any sustained G. And there is a culture around simulator training, which I'll come to later, but um, that's a, one of the six axis simulators. And this is the inside of one of those simulators, a 767 one. This is a, a takeoff. And you can see that um, casual look from the inside, that's me putting the autopilot in. Um, casual look from the inside, it looks, all, it looks identical to the aeroplane. The visuals have got enormously better over the years. And this is um, watching an auto land on 27 right at Heathrow. And you can see how real they look. So in a way, this disguises their shortcomings. And the flaws in the simulator training were very exposed by this accident. I've already said that bit. The simulators that the British Midland pilots had used to train their 737-400 people who were coming from either the 737-300 or the 737-200, which is really significantly different. But in any case, the simulator they did the train, the conversion training on did not have the same instruments as the aeroplane they were coming on to. Because simulator training twice a year, six months to check refresher routines, you get up eight, hour, eight hours in the machine and that time is tight. Many things have to be, many competencies have to be demonstrated. Um, a cycle every two years of going through all the major emergencies like hydraulics and electrics and pneumatics has to be got through. So that they have a sort of routine to them, a bit like a driving test. And um, one of the things that happens is that all engine problems up until this date um, in the simulator had resulted in engine shutdowns because we wanted crews to practice engine shutdowns. Um, and because competencies have to be demonstrated uh, and time is limited, one of the things you have to demonstrate is the ability to fly a single engine approach by hand and a single engine go around by hand. And so usually not long after the engine has failed, the instructor would lean over and whisper in your ear, time to take the autopilot out, John. And now this is very much my opinion. This is not in the report. I am convinced that Captain Hunt took the autopilot out because that's what he had always done when there was an engine failure in the simulator. The other thing that's unrealistic about simulator training is that you don't get many of the distractions that you get in uh, in a real flight. Um, you don't get lots of chatter from other aeroplanes um, and you don't get um, blinded by sunlight coming in through the window. Uh, you don't get your ears popping, but it's the lack of um, it being realistic um, the, the um, instructor will pretend to be Heathrow Tower and then Heathrow Departures, um, but the, the, it's only him pretending to be that and you don't get any of the other things that go on in real life. So after this accident, and I'll come back to this, the Civil Aviation Authority suggests, insisted that as part of your a six monthly check refresher routine, you do some bits of training which are much more like real life. Since I started flying in 1969, um, pilots have been very skeptical about high vibration warnings on vibration instruments. Um, there were an enormous number of false positives in the early days. Um, so even if they'd noticed the high vibration indication on this flight, um, they might not have taken it all that seriously. But in addition, the instruments that were on the 737-400 were too small to read when there was heavy vibration. No one had ever asked commercial pilots to look at them, ordinary commercial pilots. The pilots involved in the development of the aeroplane are all either belong to the manufacturers or are experienced um, civil aviation test pilots or management pilots of the receiving airline. And the high vibration warning 
um, which the, I'll show you the instrument in a moment, isn't linked, wasn't linked to the master warning. There's a master warning panel which either goes yellow or red for a whole dozens and dozens of different failures, but not for a high vibration one. Uh, this is a picture of an actual 737-300 with the old-fashioned electromechanical instruments. Uh, you can see in the middle um, the, the double bank of engine instruments. You see one for the left, one for the right. Um, on uh, either side of the pedestal in the center of the cockpit, um, you've got a black screen with green bits on it. Those are the flight management computers on which the route can be built um, both horizontally and vertically and linked to the autopilot. Each pilot, of course, got an identical set of six flight instruments in front of them. Um, and down by the co-pilot's left knee are these tiny little insignificant um, high vibration indicators. But they do at least have a big white needle. And if one of them is um, in a different place from its twin, um, our brains are really quite good at noticing that and picking it up. Uh, I'm afraid this is only a flight simulator picture, but it's accurate in all major respects. And this is the 737-400 with its glass cockpit. And you've now got a cathode ray tube both for the um, blue and black instrument directly at the top one in front of the captain. Um, below that is the horizontal situation indicator, which is showing a compass, but it can also show five other displays, including a little purple line of the route you're, you're trying to fly. Um, the engine instruments, once again, in two banks, and you can see the vibration in, um, instruments have been brought onto the front panel. But they're now little LED instruments on a CRT screen, and the, the telltale on the rim is the only indication of what the vibration is. Um, they are currently reading 1.8. I don't know whether you can see that. And on the flight in question, the left-hand one was actually reading 5. But it has nothing like the visual impact of, of, the, of many of the other instruments with their digital readouts and pointers that actually swing. So in his hurry, and not helped by some very poor instrument rates, instrumentation, the co-pilot misidentified the failed engine. And at that point, he should have stopped and waited till he was certain, and certainty would have emerged. To add to the misidentification, the captain had known that on the 737-200, the air for the flight deck mostly comes from the bleeds of the right-hand engine. This isn't true on the 737-400, uh, but he thought it was. So it, it was a confirmation bias for him that the right engine, the right hand engine was the one that was the problem. It, interestingly, this points to the fact that pilots are very expensive. They're very expensive to keep on the ground and conversion courses are always short. Um, it's just a matter of cramming in what the pilots need to know in the shortest time possible. And it, there are huge gaps that what they don't know about the aeroplane. Most of the time, this has no importance at all because they don't need to know it. They need to know enough to do the normal operation and to work the emergency checklists. They were unlucky in that disconnecting the auto throttle um, the vibration stopped almost immediately um, and that once they'd retarded the right hand thrust lever the vibration and smoke died away completely and some of that was just bad luck and then they shut the working engine down which they didn't need to do and had there been a high vibration checklist which there was within two months of this accident they would have known that the thing to do was just to throttle back the vibrating engine until the vibration stopped. Had they done that, of course, when they needed the, um, the, the right-hand engine on the approach into um, East Midlands, um, they would have been able to push the throttle forward, and a few seconds later, they'd have had power. And as I've started to explain before, 
by diverting to East Midlands Airport was the correct decision, but the fact that they were so close did mean that they were short of time, made themselves short of time. And they were hugely distracted. They were distracted by the need to communicate with cabin crew and the company. Um, they were distracted by uh, several changes of frequency. Each time you change frequency, you have to, um, the co-pilot had to call them up, identify themselves, make clear what they were trying to do, ask for what help they needed, um, didn't get time to think. And all of those things and the co-pilot who'd recently finished the conversion course onto this aeroplane spent some time trying to build the route onto the final approach for the westerly runway at east midlands into the flight management computer so that he could draw a nice purple line on his horizontal situation indicator Sadly, he didn't know the first step he had to do, just like I didn't know the first step I had to do to start sharing my screen this evening. Um, and for in every simulator detail that I did for the rest of my career, at some point, you would have to change your destination in flight. And once you change the destination, you can build ever such a pretty route to get to it any way you like. But he didn't know that and no one had ever practiced it. And it wasn't strictly necessary because he could have turned the um, controller for that instrument back into the compass like instrument that he'd been flying for the last 10 years. They could have flown it just, and my instructors a year later when I converted onto this airplane were saying, if things go wrong in the first few weeks, just turn it back into a 200. Give yourself the instruments you're used to until you've got really used to using the more complex and better ones. It's a requirement to, for flight crew that after any major failure, um, that when time permits, you complete a review and have a second look at what you think happened and what you've done about it. And the captain tried to do that several times and each time he tried to do it, he was interrupted. I think one of the things I want to add at this point is that um, there's been huge emphasis on the way pilots talk to each other and work together on the flight deck. It's human factors training. And there was no criticism of the way that these two had worked together that day. And then we come to the fact that no one told the pilots what they, what they and I put it in inverted commas, knew. The cabin crew sort of knew that this mistake had been made. I was very fortunate that um, three of the British Midland cabin crew who were on this flight, I think they must have been at the back of the aeroplane where uh, they're in rearward facing, forward facing seats, um, sorry, rearward facing seats um, and at, right at the back. And they joined British Airways and they made a wonderful 15 minute video about what it was like to be on this flight, which we showed on the training course I helped to present. Um, and they, they had heard him say that the, it, they'd shut down the right-hand engine, but they also had seen the flames coming out of the left-hand one. One of the issues, I think, is what you call right and left on an aeroplane, and you're actually meant to always say left about left facing forward, like port on a, a ship. Um, but also, the, and the report puts this beautifully, that there was nothing in their training, in their culture, or in any of their previous experience, which had suggested to them that they might go onto a flight deck and say, Captain, are you sure you've done the right thing? And some of the passengers knew. They'd heard the captain say that he shut down the right-hand engine. They'd seen the flames from the left-hand engine, and they sort of knew that he'd done the wrong thing. But do passengers tell an airline captain that he might have done the wrong thing? So here's the error chain that I've constructed. It's not everything that's in the report, and there are things that happened after the crash that made it much worse. Um, they're about cabin design, about where the um, hand baggage is stowed, about the design of the floor itself. Um, but as a pilot, um, I think that's for uh, aircraft engineers. I lost interest when he hit the embankment. 
this is a graphic of an error chain and the point that this graphic is making is that uh, intended to make is that you don't need to get rid of all these causes if you can get rid of just one this accident won't happen so that's the error chain and this is what then happened 8th of January the accident occurs two days later all this particular mark of engines have been boroscoped and their fan blades ex inspected by February the flight crews who are flying this sort of aeroplane have all been briefed about what happened and they and there is a checklist now for a high vibration and they've all been told about it and then in early June two identical aeroplanes had similar engine failures um, one of these was a Dan Air one and I can't remember what the other one was um, both of them the flight crew merely throttled the the vibrating engine backwards landed perfectly safely on one engine as you would always be able to do um, uh, but after two almost identical failures in June the civil aviation grounded all of these aeroplanes with those engines what strikes me about this is the sheer speed at which this stuff got done and 14 months afterwards uh, the full accident report is published with 31 recommendations the main ones of which are that simulators must have the correct instruments otherwise they're not training the crews properly the training must include reacting to high vibration indicators the that's what i talked about line, line orientated flight training that you do real-time emergency practice and this got to be quite fun because they used to video it and play it back to you afterwards and invite you to critique your own performance and how you communicated with the other pilot they also said that pilots must train with cabin crew um, which hadn't happened very much at all in the past and as when I retired which is nearly 20 years ago now um, it still wasn't happening it's just too expensive for the airline the six monthly renewals we now have to reprogram the flight management system in flight by putting in a new destination and air traffic control took very much to heart their part in this and they've now set up a system where if an aeroplane get, has a serious problem or makes a mayday call um, they get put onto a separate radio channel it's the only one they'll be put onto it's the only one they'll have to attend to there will be no one else on it uh, the accident report asks that more um, assessment by what I'd call ordinary pilots people who have no particular extra responsibilities should be asked to assess the way that information displayed as far as I know this has never happened and they also asked for a CCTV because pilots can't see their own airplane you can only see about six inches of it looking forward and it's very hard even to see the tips of the wings by craning your neck out of the side window uh, towards the side window um, and some of the more modern aeroplanes do indeed have CCTV um, which would have been a great help to them on this occasion and then the engines had to be redesigned and recertified um, and it meant a complete redesign of the uh, fan blades with a, um, a different structure and a different root system for attacking them attaching them to the hub of the rotating assembly We're nearly at an end now. These are the what I think are the wider lessons. Whenever there's a tragedy, lawyers are looking for a single cause. They may well be interested in error chains, but insurance companies and um, want somebody to blame. And so do members of the public. And I think one of the comparisons I'm going to make now is Hillsborough which was certainly an error chain a very considerable error chain um, and people um, still want somebody to be held to account and punished for it i can find no trace anywhere in what i've read that anyone ever asked for the captain of this airplane um, to be punished or or blamed or prosecuted 
I think there's an instinctive feeling amongst um, the public that the people who sit at the very front of an aeroplane are, aren't trying to do things wrong. Um, but it's interesting because the blame factor interacts with what you want to do next, which is make sure that no one else had dies the same. And that's why I think this whole story has a little bit more general um, uh, relevance in that um, a lot of accidents and especially the more significant tragedies happen because of error chains and, and the two um, the time um, there's the Ladbroke Road train crashes is one where there were several um, pre-existing problems and many reported passings of a signal at danger but then other things went wrong on the day I think that Chernobyl is a, a colossal error chain, but the grandmother and grandfather of all error chains, in my view, is Grenfell. And the other wider lesson is about authority gradients. Now, authority gradients can be very obvious, that the bullying boss who shouts at people, the, the, the sergeant major, the stereotypical sergeant major um, shouting at young recruits. Um, and it's very obvious in hierarchical organizations like the army, the police, uh, the church, might I suggest, everything. But there are much more subtle forms as well. Um, I bet many of you have worked in industry, and I don't suppose it's generally considered career enhancing to disagree um, with something that your boss strongly believes. And then there's the even more subtle one of the role you're in. Um, I was on a, a bus coming out from um, York towards Acom last year and at the bottom of Acom Hill by the Fox pub, the driver went straight on instead of turning left. And I turned to my neighbour and said, he's gone the wrong way. And he said to me, perhaps there's a road closed because we're passengers. The driver can't be wrong, can he? And from that, I would draw very briefly some general lessons for safety critical environments and that is the thing that aviation gets right is that by and large in aviation if you report honest mistakes you won't be blamed you won't be punished for them unless there is gross negligence involved and because of this um, an enormous number of near misses of things that didn't quite go wrong of mistakes I made I don't want to make again get reported and the lessons learned from them I think my um, the people I know who are doctors are very uh, envious of this um, and it's not uh, the same in medicine and people are scared I so I'm told of reporting near misses and the things they get away with and in flying when I was doing it, and I'm sure it's still true, there were various layers of confidential um, incident reporting. So that if you were flying with somebody senior to you who didn't want to report something, you could report it confidentially if you didn't want to dob him or her in. Um, and there were additional layers that you could report things through the union or through a charity that the Civil Aviation Authority set up so that whatever way you feel you can let somebody know that you got away with it this time there are ways of doing it and i think it's probably a long way from the popular imagination about airline captains that um, it is a requirement that you demonstrate not only um, the ability to accept challenge but on your Every time you're in a training environment, you are required to demonstrate that you encourage and create an atmosphere um, on the flight deck that encourages challenge. It's a long way from James Roberts and Justice for those older people here. And then, of course, flying invests colossal quantities of money in training. Um, and um, I think that that's any safety critical environment has to make a similar investment. I think you've got that by now. Blame does not improve future safety. Authority gradients are pernicious in any safety environment. Um, anyone can see 
that the senior person is about to make a mistake. But the good news is that aviation is very good at learning from accidents and that is why flying is so safe. Thank you. Thanks very much, John, uh, for, a very, for an absolutely excellent uh, uh, lecture. Uh, I'll just ask if anyone has any questions. I can see who raised their hand, sorry. Um, did someone just raise, all oh, right. Andy, did you raise your hand, Andy or Heather? Hello there, yep. Um, John, you mentioned uh, the Civil Aviation Authority as the um, authority that uh, certified the engines. Was it the UK Civil Aviation Authority? I mean, what about the other aviation authorities uh, regarding certification of these particular engines. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't actually know. Um, it, a lot of it's now done by the European um, Aviation Authority. Uh, I, I don't technically know. Sorry. Well, I did hear that it was um, the engine. I think is a French manufactured engine, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. Fr I, French, I, Ameri I, French yeah, American so consortium. Yes, I mean, I did hear it was uh, the, the French Certification Authority, but I don't know. You're probably right, but the, the Civil Aviation Authority must have been satisfied with it. Sure. Sarah Kay, did you raise your hand? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Fantastic. Thanks so much for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm actually a cognitive psychologist and I was really interested to hear you mention things like confirmation bias and visual perception with the information displays. And so I was wondering whether there is any collaboration between psychologists and pilots to look at the best ways to design things like information displays. And, and if not, why not? <laughs> I, I'm sure there is, but of course it's way over my my pond life level of of being a pilot. Uh, this is the sort of thing that Boeing and Airbus, I'm sure, talk to um, all sorts of people about the best way to design things. But way outside my scope. <laughs> okay, thank you. I I just flew them. <laughs> Yep. Hopefully you can hear me. I've put the camera on as well. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. Really interesting stuff. Uh, fascinated to notice that you mentioned specifically uh, the military as one of those hierarchical organisations, which makes challenge very difficult. Um, so I'm actually in the military uh, and I'm doing some research into um, why we find challenge very difficult in that military context. And I'm looking at it from something called constructive deviance. I was just wondering what your thoughts are as to what can we do in a military, hierarchical, uniformed, obedient, conformist organisation? What can we do to encourage people to challenge and actually call the boss out when it's blatantly obvious that he's getting it wrong? Yes, I think what happened in flying was that after the um, Trident crash at Staines in 72, um, a lot of attention was given to insisting that captains um, became their duty to encourage challenge. Um, and then it gradually seeps into the culture, but it took a long time um, until a cabin crew member came onto the flight deck and said, um, I, did you really need to rush that approach as much as you did? Um, it made chaos in the cabin, which someone charmingly once said to me, I was so proud of what I'd done as well. Um, so, um, I think, and the other thing, of course, I, I don't know how you square it with the need that the military has for people to obey in difficult circumstances. It's a real obedience, is, obedience isn't good for safety. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks very much.
Jeremy, we can barely hear you at all. Uh, can you hear me now? How about this? Sorry, no, it was my fault. Um, so Scott, can you can you carry on with your question? Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, just very quickly in reply to the the question about what can the army learn from it. You you're quite right, depending on what your role is in the army. Uh, it can't be. It's not always a good thing to have people questioning decisions. You know, if the, if you're in the infantry and the sergeant decides that Private Jones and Private Smith are going to storm that machine gun nest, you can't have a bit of a discussion about you know whether Private Milligan is actually the better chap for doing that. You know, someone has to go and storm the machine gun nest there and then. <coughs> discussion. Whereas in other things, if you're in the Royal, Royal Signals or something, I guess there there is more room for that. So it perhaps doesn't transfer it across from the aviation to, to the military. Um, a, a woman asked it earlier on about um, do psychologists get involved in in designing cockpit layouts and things like that? Uh, I think they probably do and it goes back as far as the fact that often I think the the warning voices have, have a female voice and it, it was said by some people that the reason for that is that men respond better to instructions being shouted at them and by a female than they do to a, to a male voice but uh, again I, I don't think all the warning voices are uh, female now but uh, I've certainly heard it said before that there was a deliberate reason for having voices in, in certain male or female uh, accents uh, I don't know if you're able to add anything to that No, but I, I would like to come back briefly to the um, question of the, the military. Um, I've just remembered a wonderful error chain, actually. Um, it's called The Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, and the wonderful book by Cecil Woodham Smith called The Reason Why, which sketches out the most enormous error chain. Absolutely right. Thank you, John. John Hamilton, do you have a question? Yeah, th thanks, Jeremy. Um, thank you, John. Uh, great presentation. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, simple question. Um, if the pilot and co-pilot had uh, not taken control, if it had been left on auto as much as possible, um, would that have improved the situation or did they have to take control? I, I'm glad you asked that because that's something I entirely forgot to say. Um, that one of the reasons they took the autopilot out was because they'd been always had to in the simulator. Uh, another reason is that um, no one had ever practiced f up until that point flying with one engine failed and the autopilot in. And it's actually not difficult to do, but you have to apply the rudder trim manually on the 737 because it doesn't have a rudder tr a channel on its autopilot. So it takes a, a bit of getting used to and um, of course, three months later, when we're in the simulator, you are required to do just that at some point during the check refresher um, cycle. You have to practice flying. And yes, it would have helped hugely. Hand flying the aeroplane saps your concentration. Um, it's, it, it's a constant needing attention, um, even when you're very experienced. And it's, it'd be much better to get the autopilot to do it. Another thing towards the end of my career that I would have done differently myself is that I chose, and pilots are increasingly doing this, that if there's a complex emergency situation, get the co-pilot to fly the aeroplane or use the autopilot to fly the aeroplane. Unload yourself. You're there to make decisions. Right. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, Gordon McNeil. Did Gordon McNeil ask a question? Right. I'll go on to Andy and Heather again. Hello. Just to, for the lady, I think it's called Sarah, was asking about do psychologists get involved? Um, a long time ago, I used to work for what was then called the British Aircraft Corporation. Um, and uh, we had a team there who called themselves Human Factors uh, that was staffed full of psychologists and, 
uh, people of that kind of ilk. Uh, and um, in fact, I know somebody now who uh, uh, works for um, BAE Systems uh, in military aircraft design, who does exactly that again, uh, looking at the way in which humans interact with the machine. Uh, and it's a, it's a big discipline. Uh, there's a lot of it about, so to speak, and it's developed over the years uh, from when I was involved on the sort of sidelines of it uh, 40 odd years ago. John, did you want to make a comment? I, I've, I've got that you raised your hand. Oh, right. No, I, I was about um, autopilots and engines out. Done. OK, fine. Um, there's a question from John and Alan and Coulson. Yeah. Well, th thanks for that talk. Um, I read in the press today that the Boeing Max had started flying again and it flew in Brazil. And I wondered what your take on that incident was, John. Uh, this is one I, why I worried about talks being recorded. <laughs> um, the the 737 MAX, uh, I think we're going to see um, some, I mean, we've already seen some very critical interim reports. Um, Boeing and the Federal Aviation Authority had got too close to each other. There was a massive attempt to, as you've already heard me say, to persuade everybody that the aeroplane was so similar to 